And thank you for the opportunity that you are affording me to take us all on a little journey, if you will consent to go along on this journey. One of the things that um, is commonly said of psychedelics or entheogens is that they can generate new thinking, stimulate new thinking, create or foster open-mindedness. And for some people in the room, this presentation is going to bank on that capacity pretty heavily. Without a doubt, there's a great diversity of people in this room, including diversity of religious or cultural backgrounds. And I also want to say right off uh, that there are people in this room, I'm sure, who have been wounded by religion and possibly really deeply wounded by religion to the point even of PTSD and you know, recurring negativity around the word religion. So a special thank you to you for being willing to come along on this little journey. Why bother having this conversation? Have you ever had an experience where there's something in your life which at first you kind of don't like or think is boring or completely irrelevant and then something changes and becomes very important to you? Um, how are we doing on sound? Let me try this. Is that all right? And I'll try to be robotic. So I'm Instead of, okay, good, thank you. Um, so imagine there's something that you didn't pay much attention to or you had a negative relationship to it. Uh, pick something like Brussels sprouts uh, or maybe physical exercise. Do you have one in mind, something you used to not like or not pay attention to, and then suddenly at some point in your life it started to show promise? I think there's something really big which if you hadn't paid attention to it may show some promise. In what I'm going to be sharing this afternoon, I want to acknowledge that virtually nothing I'm telling you is a thought original to me. Almost everything comes from a set of revered mentors and elders to whom I am extremely grateful. And I won't take the time to say very much about most of these people except for one, Brother David Stendelrast, an extraordinary person, happens to be a Catholic monk in one of the monastic traditions who really opened my eyes to something that I was failing to see, like my later found love of Brussels sprouts. Okay? So thank you to my teachers. This talk, as you already know from having read the program, is about the R word. That is a very charged and loaded word with many meanings for many people. And I think in order to have a 45 minute conversation about it, we're going to need to do a little bit of work collectively which I would like to invite everyone to do. Uh, our note taker is back here. And here's the exercise I'm going to invite. It's in the realm of emptying your teacup before you can fill it. Have you ever heard that phrase? So let's do a little teacup emptying. I'm going to invite you, like one at a time, to provide a word. And if you'll raise your hand, I'll point at somebody. Hopefully, I'll hear you when you say it and then I'll repeat it through the audio system. The exercise is to think of negative connotations. This is like word association. What's the bad stuff that comes to mind when you hear the word religion? Go. Sin. Sin. Oh, when I point, please. Sin. Dogma. Uh, I need to point, so yes, please. Inquisition. Division. Intolerance. Restrictive. Persecution. Persecution. Shame. Shame. Program. Thank you. I'm sorry? Repression. Repression. Thank you. Cover-ups. Cover War. War. Imposing. Imposing. Ignorance. Ignorance. Isms. Isms. Judgment. Judgment. Fear-inducing. I was going to say brainwashing, but then I remembered pedophilia. Pedophilia. <laughs> Unchanging, rigid. Fundamentalism. Guilt. Delusional. Exclusivism. Judgment. Money. Repression. Control. Fear, hell, 
divisiveness, conformism, God-fearing, crusade, abuse, hierarchy, opulent, awe-killing, killing awe. Thank you. Arrogance, intolerance, sexual repression, evolution, middleman, Can I have one? Ineffective. Misogynistic. Fear of transcendence. Patriarchal. War. Placebo. OK. Get the picture? Please, please take a minute. Please take a minute and, and step into all of that negativity. Maybe close your eyes if that helps. If you've had personal contact with it, personal wounding with it, you know people who have, please take a minute and step into that. Imagine centuries, millennia of this. Imagine the effect of these things on humanity. It's pretty easy to see why the R word has the bad rap that it does. Yeah? Yeah, those things are all real and present in the world in some instantiations of some religion. <sighs> Can you please do whatever you need to do to try to turn the teacup upside down? And don't worry, those things are still in the world. We're not getting rid of it here. We're just getting rid of it from our minds for the next little bit of time. So if you have some little metaphor, just like chuck that stuff. And now let's suppose, hope that we have something of a clean slate. Can we do the corresponding exercise? One at a time, same protocol. What positive associations do you have with the word religion? Community. Faith. Hope. Mystical tradition. Charity. Transcendence. Stained glass windows. Stained glass windows. <laughs> Communion with God. Ritual. Ritual. Devotion. Devotion. Sanctuary. Sanctuary. Service. Service. Bach. Bach. Johann Bach. First Amendment, First Amendment rights. Singing. Singing. Culture, forgiveness, forgiveness. forgiveness. rules, rules. Love. spirituality, grace, grace. grace. Mystery. mystery, liberation, connection, connection. connection. union, initiation, initiation. Awe. awe, structure, structure. love, love. Enduring, foundation. enduring foundation. Dark star. <laughs> Rock of ages. Choir. 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 Choirs. Choirs. Good architecture. Good architecture. <laughs> Mercy. Generosity. Generosity. Salvation. Salvation. Trust. Non-duality. Non -duality. Angels. Meaning. Meaning. I'm sorry? Second chances, forgiveness. Second Rites of passage. Autodidacticism. Autodidacticism. Potluck suppers. Potluck suppers. Knowledge that suffers. I'm sorry? Of Acknowledgement of suffering. Universal truths. Universal truths. Heaven. Heaven. OK, got the picture? There's a lot of really profound, important, wonderful, beautiful, enduring, life-giving, life-affirming stuff there, too. Oh, boy, that's a lot. What is this thing called religion? Obviously, all of those things are associated with it. There is a psychologist of religion, somebody I count as a revered person in my lineage, named Walter Houston Clark, 
who authored a book called The Psychology of Religion. And somewhere near the beginning of that book, I think around page 23, he says, I've uh, authored a book called The Psychology of Religion, so we probably ought to talk some about what religion is. He begins by saying, we are on grounds where the experts disagree. However, for the purpose of having you understand where I'm coming from in writing this book, I'm going to offer just a starting definition. It goes like this. Religion is a person's experience of a beyond. And he capitalizes B, capital B, beyond. Religion is a person's experience of a capital B, beyond, especially as evidenced by his or her efforts to harmonize his or her life with that beyond. So first, an experience, it's an experience. Second, it's like the rest of your life attempting to harmonize with what you got from that experience of a beyond. Got it? I would like to add something to Clark's definition. When that is done in community. Experience of a beyond, harmonize in community with other people. Notice all the stuff that's missing. Dogma is not there. Ritual isn't necessarily there. Priesthood, intermediate, is not necessarily there. There's lots of things that aren't necessarily there. This is the rudimentary, essential notion of religion. So what is Clark's capital B beyond? I happen to like his use of that word because he avoids associations with other words. But the other words that are commonly used for it, uh, somebody said non-duality, mystical experience, cosmic consciousness, Christ consciousness, Buddha consciousness, a phrase that I think has some unique application is primary religious experience. These are all near synonyms for a cluster of experiences where we don't need to differentiate super finely. We can say there's a cluster of experiences that we can conveniently call a capital B beyond. Is there anyone here who finds the word beyond defensive? Like, oh, I couldn't have a beyond. I'm not seeing any hand, well, maybe one hand. Okay, one person's concerned that there's a spatial implication about it. What I'm generally seeing is, yeah, we, we can go with that for a little while. So, please let's go with that for a little while. Uh, this audience probably doesn't need to spend very much time talking about non-duality, mystical experience. Um, <clears throat> the scholar W.T. Stace did a cross-cultural study of mystical experience, found these common characteristics. The most important one, the one that is most characteristic of non-duality or mystical experience or a capital B beyond, is the unifying vision, all is one. And there are these other characteristics also that you know about, you've heard about elsewhere in this conference and have probably had. Let's move to the Johns Hopkins psilocybin experience, uh, experiments. Who here has not heard of them before? There's not a hand. Yay. Um, I won't spend a lot of time going into it. Uh, but since 2006, when the first paper was published out of Hopkins, We've reported on data coming from this campus of Johns Hopkins, coming out of this session room, where I believe about 120 unique individuals have now had psilocybin sessions, producing data that look like this, that show up in scholarly, peer-reviewed articles. I'm not expecting you to read it. <laughs> Just know that this is what science looks like when it, when it, when it turns its attention to non-duality and the other kinds of experiences that can arise on, on psilocybin. Um, I will read a little bit of this just to let you know that uh, I'm, I'm going to take liberties here. Over a large number of volunteers, over more than one study, a pretty big fraction of mentally healthy, normal volunteers with a spiritual interest, that's kind of the population we're working with, a significant fraction, a third or more, will have an experience that they rate as the single most personally meaningful or spiritually significant experience of a lifetime. Uh, roughly an additional third or more will say that a psilocybin session was in the top five of an entire lifetime. If you give people multiple shots at it, like rolling the dice multiple times, the percentage of people who report the experience is in the top five exceeds 90%. So we have here an intervention that can be applied to mentally healthy people with a spiritual interest in a laboratory that in a day or repeated over a couple of times has a high likelihood 
of taking somebody to Clark's capital B beyond. So let's fold this back into our conversation about the R word. And before doing that, I'd like to mention something else that uh, W.T. Stace contributed to this dialogue, which is the notion of causal indifference, by which he means that whatever might trigger or occasion or give rise to a mystical experience, we shouldn't be too concerned about what that trigger was. We should look at the experience itself. So if it came from fasting, if it came from childbirth, if it came from psilocybin, if it came from a near-death experience, those don't prejudice the results. And I say that because people in this room may have a tendency to privilege the entheogens. Now there's a reason for it, because we saw those statistics before uh, about how reliable trigger it can be for well-selected people under the right circumstances, but it's not the only trigger. And it's important to remember this for many reasons, one of which is diplomacy. I don't think we envision a world where everyone's going to take entheogens or wants to take entheogens, and there are plenty of other tried and true techniques that get you to the same place. So having reviewed briefly the Hopkins experiments, let's move on to the R word and to say there's non-duality. What happens when non-duality or capital B beyond experiences occur? Brother David Stendhal Rast made an extremely provocative statement to me. He asks, how does one get from a mystical experience to an established religion? The one word answer is inevitably. Do you believe it? Here's, here's his reasoning. Let's go there later. Imagine in your adult life you've not tasted non-duality before and you have a dualistic worldview, a, a, a mechanical, materialistic worldview, kind of haven't really thought about that. Maybe even your science training has drilled it out of you. And then you have this eye-opening experience. Is it fair to say you've probably either learned something or at least gotten a new perspective on ultimate reality? Well, if so, a new perspective on ultimate reality is the first little bit of doctrine. Wow. Things are more connected than I thought they were. That's a doctrine, something you now think is true about the world. That's one of the pillars of religion. So once you have this doctrine, wow, I now feel, believe, have experienced that things are more connected than I used to think, maybe that calls for you to live your life a little differently, make different decisions about yourself and your livelihood and your relationships and your health and whatnot. Well, decisions about what to do and what not to do, there's the seed of ethics. Let's suppose that these changes are, you find them enlivening. This is a quality of life improvement. This is a major gift you've been given, actually. And you would like to give thanks for it. That gives rise to ritual. Brother David, anyhow, asserts that those are the three core elements of religion. And they come from the non-dual beyond experience. There's multiple kinds of ritual. Ritual can be just to give thanks. It can be when you wake up in the morning and say, wow, it's amazing that there's something instead of nothing. I'm so grateful to be alive. Ritual can also take profound forms that have the purpose of introducing new people or yourself again to mystical experience. So some ritual takes us back to mystical experience for you or for other people. The mystical experience gives you an opportunity to sanity check your doctrine, to make course corrections. You know, the church after Galileo probably needed to make a course correction. So this is the cycle. An engineer would say this is a system. This is the system of religion when it works well. It regenerates itself. The doctrine does not harden or ossify because there's always a new mystical experience that can give rise to revisions of those things. History tells us, however, that not all religions are renewed by mystical experience, again. So that link over there, that arrow, that's an imperfect link. What happens when it's broken and stays broken for too long? Brother David says, sad as it, as it is, religion left to itself without that return to the mystical experience turns irreligious. What does that mean? Doctrine hardens into dogmatism, ethics, hardens into legalism. 
Ritual hardens into ritualism. Uh, our note taker, uh, would you please read back 10 or 12 of the very worst words slowly and I'll repeat them? Sin. Sin. Inquisition. Inquisition. Persecution. Persecution. Repression. Repression. War. War. Ignorance. Ignorance. Pedophilia. Pedophilia. Fundamentalism. Fear. Fear. Hierarchy. Hierarchy. Intolerance. Intolerance. Exclusivism. Exclusivism. Repression. 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 Abuse. Abuse. Hell. Hell. Control. Control. OK, let's stop there. Can you see how those things might flow from a failure of a healthy renewal system when that cycle stops, when these things harden, and then time goes on but they haven't changed? How that has amplified through hierarchy, through control structures, leads to a lot of the bad stuff that we uncovered at the beginning of this talk. So no wonder the R word is such a mixed and charged word. Would you please raise your hands if you would identify as spiritual but not religious? It's a goodly fraction of the, of the room. You probably know that sociologists for some decades now have been asking people, are you spiritual? Are you religious? Are you both? Are you neither? That is so common that it's led to a new little abbreviation, SBNR. I think there's actually at least two books published now that have SBNR in the title. <laughs> I'm going to go out on a limb here and say I think that's wrong, a mistake, doesn't serve. And I'm going to offer just a little hypothesis about how it came about. Suppose, let's turn the clock back a couple of decades. I think history would show that in the middle of the last century or so, the words religion and spirituality were not sharply distinguished. You wouldn't have had so many people sharply proclaiming that they're spiritual but not religious. So something has changed. Some of it is in a more globally connected environment, more news reports. Suppose you're kind of swimming around and, and all, this, all, all the words that came up here, right? All the good stuff and all the bad stuff. Psychologists have this verb to load, okay? Suppose a sociologist comes up to you and says, are you religious or are you spiritual? And you've got all this bad stuff cooking around in your head and all this good stuff cooking around in your head you're going to load the bad stuff onto one word just because you were given an opportunity to do it. And you're going to load the good stuff onto the other word because you were given an opportunity to do it. Rinse, repeat. Rinse, repeat. Fifty years later, there's a lot of people who, oh, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. And I think we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. I hope you're tracking so far. Okay, if, if we can keep the teacup pretty empty of the bad stuff, and we can look at this very simplified model of religion, it will give us eyes to see something that you probably couldn't other see, otherwise see. And that is that religion turns up, or religious aspects, the phenomenon of religion, that cycle, it turns up in a lot of places. So if part of the game here, this little journey we're on for just this hour, uh, is to not be so prejudicial about the word religion, what else can you do instead? If I'm asking you to not load the bad stuff on the word religion, how about using adjectives instead? If something bothers you about religion, you could say, oh, I'm not anti-scientific, or oh, I'm not oppressive, or oh, I'm not intolerant. You can talk about religious communities in terms of immature or mature, or there are pathological ones versus wholesome ones. There are ones that really haven't gone through the mystical renewal in a long time. They're kind of dead. They're pretty stuck. And there are ones that are vital in renewing. Do you see the huge opportunity that opens up when we use adjectives instead of throwing everything out under one word that we've put in the trash bin? So if you do this enough, if you get steeped in the idea of saying, if I want to criticize something, let me try to be more targeted in what I'm criticizing, we can see religion in more places. Anyone recognize this? This is a satellite photograph of Burning Man. 
the annual festi festival that occurs in the Nevada desert, uh, order of 40, 50,000 people these years. Burning Man, at least early on, probably at present, strongly disclaims that, it, oh, it's not a religion. Oh, we're an arts festival, we're a music festival. Oh, there might be some spirituality, but we're not religion. Well, let's go back to Clark's three pillars. Does the Burning Man experience, for anyone who's gone, support an experience of a beyond? Is that a decent place to go in order to have an experience one way or another, causal indifference, that may take you out of your usual frame? I, I heard at least one yes. Do I hear any no's? Okay. So it supports, it's, it goes without saying. Do participants learn from those experiences? Okay. That's the doctrine part. You learn something new about ultimate reality or something important about how people operate or communities operate. So you take away a little bit of doctrine from it. How about ethics? Does Burning Man offer ethical teachings? I'm looking for something that's not showing up on the presentation. There we go. Burning Man has codified a Ten Commandments. <laughs> they actually call it the Ten Principles. And it's a really nice little document about how to get along in community and how to you know, have a little contained sample of living in a different way. So yeah, it's there. This one goes without saying, too, is there a ritual at Burning Man? It isn't one ritual. It's not from one tradition. It's kind of everyone doing what they want. But tons of ritual gets generated. And often it serves to recreate the beyond experience, celebrate the beyond experience, and share it with others. So seen through this cleansed lens, can you see at least religious aspects in Burning Man? Burning Man might not want to be called a religion. But this is another opportunity to broaden our vocabulary. You can call something a religion, which sounds like it's got a name and it's got really definite traditions and doctrine and you know, that's, that's pretty restrictive. You can also just say it's religious, like it, it smells and feels and tastes like a religion. Or if you want to back off a little further, you can say, oh, it's got religious elements. So I'm, just, I'm, I'm not attempting to label Burning Man here. I just want to increase our vocabulary for locating that cycle, the mystical renewal cycle in places we might not ordinarily expect to find it. How about other groups with religious aspects? Can you think of some? There's various festivals. What happened at 1015 Folsom last night? Anyone go? It might be this group, or at least the subset of this group, that went to 1015 Folsom for a bicycle day dance celebration. There are ecstatic dance communities. There's probably a whole bunch of communities that call themselves spiritual communities because they need to shy away from the R word, otherwise no one will come. So that cycle is alive and well, but it's just not always self-recognized or recognized by others. Back to those nasty pathologies. Separated from personal experience, sexual exploitation, quietism, idolatry, da 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 da. Are they inevitable? I don't think so. I think it's possible to reform or restructure or to structure religion anew in ways that minimize the likelihood of all those pathologies and all that bad stuff from coming up. Are there existence proofs in the world? So Alcoholics Anonymous does not call itself a religion. But taking from that vocabulary, I'm going to assert that it's got religious aspects. Let's look at some of the ways, not of what they do with alcoholics, but how they've decided to structure themselves. They've got not only the 12 steps, but something they call the 12 traditions. One of them is minimizing the problems of money, property, and prestige. They don't own very much. They don't own the buildings they have their meetings in. They pass the hat to collect money to cover the rent. Uh, they stay anonymous, in part, because they want to avoid problems of ego. Each group needs the least possible organization. I love that exact turn of phrase. Each group needs the least, needs the least possible organization. Why? There's less to go wrong. There's less structure that gets ossified and can outgrow its usefulness. Rotating leadership is best. They do acknowledge that there may be some specialists that they want to keep on in a particular role, but the general notion of, reader, of leadership can be shared and passed around the, the circle. Authority from God is expressed in the group, not expressed in an individual. So they're, they're kind of buffering themselves from, somebody said delusion here, like one person's kind of going off on a tangent is going to get, going to get checked by the group. 
So we know God is speaking more loudly if it's coming through more people than just one. Each group is self-supporting. There's no big hierarchy with you know, some sovereign state over in Europe with its own international country code, etc. cetera. Um, the last one here, they, they've decided to grow through attraction rather than promotion. I love that phrase too, attraction, not promotion. What does that have the effect of? It has the effect of saying, we're not proselytizing. If we are attractive to you, you will come to us. So they're not really competing. They've taken themselves out of competition for membership. Let's take another example. The Quakers, also known as the Religious Society of Friends. One reason in casual conversations that I have with people where they say they don't like religion is because they think that being a part of a religion means you have to believe something. And you may show up in a building where you're required to say words out loud about what you believe and what happens if you don't believe exactly that, thi that thing? You're basically forced to perjure yourself. But it's not true that religions need to be creedal. The Quakers are a non-creedal religion. You can come believing anything or nothing. They do hold as a loosely held concept of the, of the organization that there's something of God, whatever that means to you and everyone. They make decisions by a process they call unity. Uh, I like the word concord. They are very heavily engaged in social justice. Remember those three dots? Mystical experience gives doctrine, then ethics. Like if you've had an experience of a beyond, there's stuff you feel compelled to do in the world out of compassion, because nothing is separate from you. So there's something that actually most would agree is a religion. It's a received tradition. It's been around a long time, many, many generations. And it's got a lot of these desirable qualities. And when's the last time you've ever heard of a sexual scandal involving a Quaker clerk? Let me know if you do. New groups have a lot more freedom to explore different structures. It's like setting the DNA. Okay? So if you're starting a new group or if you're in a group that doesn't have a thousand year old tradition, you can decide to try rotating leadership. You can try to decide a, a different way of making decisions. That's the benefit of starting afresh. What's the benefit of working within a received tradition? I mean, it, it's some of that beautiful stuff we talked about before. It's the stained glass windows that were built 500 years ago. Uh, it's reciting words and rituals that your forebears did more generations back than you can count. If you hear somebody talk about that who's deeply steeped in a religion, which I unfortunately am not really, it's actually beautiful and moving to hear how much meaning and comfort comes from feeling connected to something that's been practiced and recited for generation after generation. Um, so this is nearing the end of my little wrap on R word. Uh, let me summarize a, a few points for you. One reason to renegotiate our relationship to the word religion is that it's not going away. Even if you hate it and you wish it were, it's not going away. In fact, according to the cycle that we talked about before, it's, it's going to keep recreating even if the received traditions went away. So it's here. If you don't like it, one thing you can do is oppose it. But Aikido, a martial art which I'm somewhat familiar with, teaches something different. Instead of oppose, uh, opposing, you blend with it. Um, it's probably worth a minute to try to demonstrate that. Suppose somebody's coming at me, like with an attack of one kind. The usual thing might be to like, you know, either run or to like frontally attack back, to counterattack. And Aikido teaches that that's not very effective. It's going to lead to harm to both parties. A little sidebar here. The founder of Aikido, a lot of martial arts are pretty, you know, kick-ass, tough, whatever. The sensei, the founder of Aikido, was all about the love. If you read what he wrote in his life, it's all about peace and taking care of people and non-harmfulness. So his teaching, embodied in a martial art, is if something is coming at you, instead of harming it to stop it from harming you, you blend with it. You see its energy coming, you calculate the trajectory, you blend with it, and once you've blended with it, then you can take it into a safe direction. There's something really profound in that, and I'm, I'm not going to say exactly how I think it relates to this, except that I'm pretty sure that it does. We're learning to do religion better, and learning to do religion better could be, I think it's an understatement to say, potentially a very great good on planet Earth. And as we're doing religion better, maybe the most important thing to remember about doing religion better is that direct experience is what keeps it vital, 
tempering it through community is what keeps it from going off in weird, unserviceable directions. And something that has given me a sense of freedom, good night's sleep in my life is developing an understanding that these kinds of cycles aren't going to happen in five years or 10 years or a generation. The kinds of things we're talking about here at the conference, some things, this clinical trial and this you know, FDA approval of a study, those things can happen in a two-year, five-year, or 10-year time frame. But the, the healing of the world, the perfection of the world, is probably a never-ending process. I can't see that far ahead. It's surely going to be taking place well beyond the expected lifetime of anyone in this room and times 10. In a way, there's comfort in that, isn't there? We don't have to do it all. We just need to do what's in front of us and trust that in the long run, all will be well. Thank you for your attention. Are you going to take questions? Questions. We've got good time. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I was wondering what you thought about where we are right now sort of is, is going to allow us to, because I also believe in the, in, in the power of the long run. I'm with you on the optimism. But I want to know what concrete things you think that we can hold on to point to the fact that we are at a point where we could be continuing in an even more positive direction than before, as opposed to being just at a high point in the cycle itself. Uh, which we? <laughs> like at this conference or the world? Like the world, I guess. Co co collectively, just um, the fact, um, the idea that we can uh, sort of direct spiritual experience to like a better, to like a higher. Uh, uh, the question is, I understand to, to avoid is, to avoid these the, 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 the negative. To avoid the pathologies right. and to and to avoid the bad stuff that happens. That's a really huge question. Um, I don't know. Uh, whatever's, wh whatever's right in front of you is the easiest thing. When you see bad stuff, call it out. Mm. Pin the blame in the right place. The next time you hear about something abusive or guilt trippy or something that's ossified, don't say bad religion and you know, let it go. You could give it some constructive feedback. So that's one thing I could think to do that's often right in front of each of us. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> the speaker at dinner tonight, uh, I heard him say on another occasion, that today's world is suffering from an epidemic of isolation and loneliness. Now, I don't know if that's true for people in this room, but for people that have distanced themselves from spiritual communities, from religious communities because of the pathologies, maybe you would like more of it. Maybe you would like some recurring, dependable ritual like Bicycle Day in your life. Go make it. Find friends that want to do that with you. And maybe if it was a good thing one year, you'll want to do it again the next year. Maybe some of this will have left an impression with you, and as you learn how to make decisions as a group and rotate the leadership and so on, you will be generating structures that are more resilient. So those are the two things I can, I can think of, and I'm sure there's plenty more. Thank you. Um. So in your cycle of, oh, hello, over here. Thank you. Hey, Th thank you very much for your talk. Um, so in your cycle of religion or the system, I'm an engineer, so that mm -hmm. makes sense, the loop, um, there's a process of um, the direct experience, the ineffable experience, and then immediately after the conceptualization of that experience, and that you know, then goes through some process. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like the goal of certain religions very in, intently, um, particularly Eastern religions, is um, to have the loop, instead of going from the ineffable experience to the conceptualization of that experience, from the ineffable experience to a realization or a persistent non-conceptual experience um, that remains and it avoids that process continuing, continuing, continuing. Do you see that as an ultimate goal let's say, that religious loop becoming smaller and smaller and smaller until it's a point? Uh, did everyone hear the question? 
<laughs> so let me see. If, let me test my understanding, and you can give me feedback. So we have this cycle where the mystical experience leads back to realizations about true things about the world, aka doctrine and ethics and ritual, that then recreates the experience. Which the questioner said, what we're really doing is going from a non-conceptual place, non-duality, to conceptualization, and that some Eastern religions have techniques and hold up as a goal to bypass the conceptualization so as to be able to hang out in the uncrystallized. Is that a fair restatement? Sure. Okay. <laughs> you're, you're crystallizing so <laughs> <laughs> um, the question is a little above my pay grade. I'm going to say it's probably an advanced technique. And we'll find out when we get closer to it. So one of the issues with um, the renewal of religions as new religions occur as a result of personal spiritual experience and then uh, doctrine and ethics and dogma arise and a group of like-minded people get together to uh, pursue that path, um, it seems that inevitably some people within that who are far more interested in expressing their desire for control will arise in that religion. And um, St. Paul being the, the archetype of that kind of individual who fundamentally alters and imprints a different uh, method of behavior and, and activity upon the basic message of the visionary that founded it. Um, and do you have any, uh, any advice for people trying to deal with individuals like that, the controlling individuals who arise within those, those movements, because it inevitably leads to significant conflict? Thank you. Uh, I can see the seeds of that phenomenon in communities that I've had some contact with. Uh, if I can restate the question a little bit. Sometimes there can be ego problems associated with these uh, elevated experiences, inflation. And then somebody comes back to this level and kind of has a new vision or is wanting to take control, climb the ladder. And this may sound glib, but what if there's not a ladder to climb? Quakers don't have ladders. They're non-hierarchical. AA doesn't really have much of a ladder you can climb. And my guess is, if you're in one of those contexts and you get a little out of check, somebody's going to like, you know, have a few words with you. Uh, Quakers, I believe, sometimes call it laboring with a friend. Whether or not that's good enough to prevent all of the pathological situations, I don't know. <laughs> laughing works really well too, someone says. Right here. Hi. Um, it seems to me that when you are going for your uh, mystical experience, that there are different ways to achieve that. There's, you know, we've talked about uh, meditation and fasting and things like that. Um, causal, causal indifference. And it seems to me like there's sort of the hard way and the easy way. Hard way being, you know, sitting on fasting in a cave on a mountain for a lifetime. And the easy way being the psilocybin experiment. What Roland is experience. called the crash course. Exactly. So um, it, it seems to me that um, the upshot of the entire talk today is how these mystical experiences are actually very beneficial for society as a whole. And I'm wondering if you see any hope for the accelerated process uh, becoming available to people at large or if, you know, we are still going to be limited by legality and things like that. If you accelerate the process, the process will be accelerated. <laughs> Is that fair? Uh, Bob, at the uh, last slide you showed, you said, I believe, that direct experience has to be tempered through the community. Could you specify what you mean by tempered? Uh, let me see if I can get back to that. Yes, direct experience tempered through community? Yeah, yeah, thank you for asking. I haven't fully thought this out, but somebody mentioned earlier delusional states. Oh, here's an example. Um, 2012 came and went. 
there were people who had experiences that they may call an experience of a beyond, a visionary state, whatnot, who were pretty sure that like bad stuff was going down. And a lot of us didn't really believe it or were pretty sure it's going to be wrong. But you know, those ideas propagated. I think if they were more effectively tempered through community, they might not have had as much negative impact on some of the people who took it too seriously, moved out of their houses, bought a van, you know, went off and lived a different life in preparation for the apocalypse. So tempered through community to me is a little bit of a notion of the more channels you receive something on, the more confidence you can have in it. So one channel from the universal, the divine, whatever, might not be so reliable, but if you get it from 10 different sources, it's likely to be more reliable. The question over here. Um, I agree with everything you say, but uh, one thing confused me about the spiritual non-religious Com terminology, because I was one of those people, like many in the, in the room, who consider myself spiritual non-religious, for lack of a better term, um, but I don't have an aversion to religion per se. In fact, I try to glean what I can from all available religions to me. I was just wondering, you know, and I think the main problem is intolerance of religion, and I was just wondering if you had some suggestions of how we can reframe, if you had a, you know, a better way of qualifying my spiritual or religious orientation uh, so me, rather than saying that if you think that's bad. So, so let me see if I understand it. Uh, the questioner says he would identify as spiritual but not religious, but not by reason of disliking or having an aversion to religion. It's just that's kind of where you are right now. Great. You could say something like, uh, I feel spiritually alive, but I'm not really enriching that in community. I'm not doing that with other people. I don't have a structure around it. And that's serving me very well right now. Thank you. Uh, so, over here. Uh, Thank you. Alan de, Alan de Botan has uh, written kind of extensively on this, and he recently published a book called Religion for Atheists, mm -hmm. um, basically talking about the, the positive aspects of religion that we're sort of missing in today's society, including uh, sort of sacred texts and um, the, the role of the priest has been just like completely unfulfilled. We have psychotherapists, but they're seen more as, you know, like a, a, a place to go when you're like mentally ill. And so there's a, a social stigma on getting therapy. And uh, so I, I just kind of wondered uh, what your perspective is on uh, trying to build a, a framework in which um, we can have a, a religious uh, community um, for people who have atheist tendencies and, and uh, how to uh, go about sort of uh, becoming that spiritual counselor and uh, being available to people and et cetera. Mm. I think what the question is, is this. Somebody who does not have, uh, for maybe for whom the capital B beyond is not a very alive concept what kind of community might be available to him or her? Is that more or less it? How do you build a community of seekers, people who are curious, but are staunchly anti-religious? Um, well, I, th I think you do it. Yeah, I think you do it just like you know you would if they were religious. If this is of interest to you, you can try to chip the barnacles off the bottom of the boat called religion. You can try to detoxify that word, but the process of building community is probably not terribly different as a function of its name. Somebody said dance music community. <clears throat> yes, using the uh, the Native American church and the UDV as kind of a roadmap and a paradigm for what is possible concerning sacrament. Um, what do you think would be the roadmap to utilize and perhaps parlay some of the Johns Hopkins findings with psilocybin to creating a new religion that was able to allow psilocybin as their sacrament, uh, even though it perhaps doesn't have the same kind of history that the UDV or the Native American church has? Um, the questioner says, looking at the UDV or the Native American Church, two organizations that are now allowed to use a Schedule I controlled substance in religious practice, how might that generalize to a different group using psilocybin? Uh, the first answer is very, very carefully. 
and probably not very quickly. What that might look like, in my mind, is a group of people who get along well, maybe who've had some ritual going on for some time as a group with a solid identity. Maybe there's something you do once a quarter or once a year. There is actually some tradition associated with it. Even if it's only a couple years old, it's still some tradition. And for that group to start adding a little bit of self-awareness about its desire to, to follow that path. A very important checkpoint would be to test the sincerity of the people who are doing it. Anything that looks or smells like, oh, we're just going to do this in order to you know, go to court and get a stay out of jail free card. I don't know, my, my karma sense says that's not going to have a good outcome. So find a sincere group of people who have some sense of doctrine, ethics, and ritual who are prepared to go down that road. And it's going to be a long, hard, and probably scary road. But I do believe it will happen. Hi. Uh, so thanks for the talk. I, 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 I seem to recall you mentioning briefly that you came from a background that, that wasn't actually very steeped in uh, religious tradition. Uh, as you as you think of it here, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm I'm just curious. One thing that seemed sort of notably absent from your talk, and I'm not actually familiar with your work, but um, clearly this is of uh, central importance to you. You spent a lot of time with this topic, and I'm I'm just curious, like where, what brought you into uh, uh, focusing so much thought and uh, uh, consideration around this topic. Um, I'll answer partly going back to your reflecting back to me that I said I don't have much of a deep immersion in a tradition. Uh, my family of origin was nominally church going. My relationship to the church was mostly singing in the choir. I loved that and the pageantry and the incense and whatnot. And I became uncomfortable with it. Keep in mind I'm an engineer and engineers tend to be pretty literal minded. And I started paying attention for the first time to the creed that I had been saying, you know, pretty often for a long time without paying attention to it. I thought I don't actually believe this. You know, this wasn't part of the creed, but you know, if it says on page one, heaven and earth was made in six days, I don't think that's true. And if that's on page one, it's not going uphill from there. <laughs> um, so I kind of fell out of it because I, it, just did, it seemed anti-scientific. And uh, I think it's a longer story than I would like to go into here about what got me back on track. Um, some of it is, I'm, I'm skipping many, many steps. But when I try to think about what it's going to take to generate a planet with much less optional suffering and much more happiness. It's going to take structures and communities and a good bit of mystical awareness. And I, I think you can't do it by putting it in the water supply. There really need to be communities and tempering. And when you start talking about those things, once you take the blinders off because of the bad stuff around the R word, you say, oh, that's religion. So. This, too, seems like a really tough road to hoe, but it really is the only one I can think of that might, given enough generations, lead to a really much happier place. Um, how are we on time? Five more minutes. By the way, thank you for sticking with this. If what you're saying here is so compelling, then why not rename your organization Council for Religious Practices? Eh, because it takes a bunch of paperwork. <laughs> G give you an answer. Um, we, we chose the most generic name that we could think of, specifically so that we wouldn't have to spend a lot of time explaining it or defending it or knocking barnacles off of various words. Um, this is an opportunity to say, th say something about nomenclature. I have a mixed relationship with the word psychedelic. It's the word I grew up with. It rolls off of my tongue easily. Uh, I like its etymology, and I've become keenly aware that for some people and some audiences of some culture, for some people, when you say that word, whatever the clock cycle is of, of brain stuff, stuff happens really quickly, and what gets evoked is bell bottoms and war protest and the Grateful Dead and such, and it's just, it's an unhelpful set of associations. So given that some, and that's why I like entheogen or even hallucinogen sometimes with all of its problems, or plant teacher or sacrament or these substances, there's lots of ways to circumlocute around it. If we were the Council on Religious Practices, 
I need to be giving this talk a lot more in order to not have people be turned off by that name. Thank you so much for this beautiful talk. Um, it seems from what you're saying that the whole separation of church and state could be revisited and also education and how we're raising our children to truly know um, would be transformed by this model, whether uh, obviously um, a, a, that the parents are, can be getting this connection and creating forms for the children that would support this deeper sense of religion. Uh, sorry, that's not really a question. But um, uh, uh, speak to the children and, and how you envision um, this model helping them. Because the Dalai Lama says, you know, turn to the children and through generations things can transform. Yeah, so the question is like, what about the kids? Uh, I, I, I want to sidestep the question about what about kids and psychoactives. I'll say again, read Aldous Huxley's book, Island. Um, but, but around the, the notion, so there's two things. Part of your question was, how do parents generate forms for their kids? I mean, so we've talked about that. Uh, be creative. Talk to other people that have generated forms for their kids. That could be a gift. I'll also say that if your kids have an opportunity to get the forms you got, or if your grandkids have an opportunity to get the forms they got from your children, they will be imbued with a richness and an extra value because they were handed down through the generations. So I don't necessarily envision reinventing this all the time just for the fun of reinventing. Yes, um, current laws are such that um, uh, CSP uh, would, would not be uh, uh, too interested in trying to develop a, a psilocybin-based religion. Uh, however, there are many places around the world where if you could establish a small office, for example, in Kuta Beach in Bali, or in Amsterdam, uh, or down in the area of Mexico where the mushroom is still legal, uh, there would be enough people here who would be interested in shaman work, I would think, uh, to come and work on a religion that might be very close to Christianity, but might be very far from it, and it would be really nice to develop a beautiful religion uh, that does have that as a core occasional sacrament. Beautiful. If you feel called to do such a thing, uh, I feel ill-advised to advise you any more than this talk has, but I just add one thing. It's really helpful to start with people you already know and love where there's already existing bonds. If that's six people or 10 people or 12 people, if you have some little seed of a community, rather than posting something on the internet and a bunch of strangers show up, you'll have a much more stable start. What's the biggest challenge facing this movement right now? Which movement? The, the, the movement to rebind us to all the factors that you've been describing here today. Developing a will to do it. Articulating a will to do it. I'll take that for the answer. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank so you much. All.